on today's show. Trey Young is the topic of conversation. Glenn Willis is back. It's part one of two, and it's coming to you right now. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1804 of the Locked on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Tuesday evening into Wednesday here in late September. And today's podcast is brought to you by the folks at the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app right now, create an account, and use promo code Locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase terms apply. I also want to tell you at the top of the podcast to make us your first listen each and every day here at Locked on Hawks. Please check us out and subscribe anywhere you find your podcasts. That includes Apple and Spotify, of course, plus Amazon Music and Overcast. We're also on YouTube. Please like this video as you're watching, and please subscribe to that platform. On today's podcast, it's actually going to be part one of two with my friend Glenn Willis of ATL and 29. Glenn has been huge coming on with me all summer long in this player capsule series, and today's focus is Trey Young. He is the penultimate one of these, Jalen Johnson, is going to be the last one that we do, but Trey Young is up now in advance of media day and training camp next week. There were some internet challenges along the way with Glenn and I, but I hope, it, and I think it is actually listening back to it. I think it's just fine to listen to. Just want to flag that in advance. Um, also, as a plug, I did a couple of mailbag driven episodes in the last couple of days one on Friday, one on Monday, including some expansion draft talk, et cetera, et cetera. Answering your questions, always send those in all the time. I will answer them either in print form or in return form on the podcast. And uh, yeah, plenty of plugs to get to as well. Last week with Anthony Irwin on the podcast, Glenn's been on a bunch of times in recent days. Uh, we had Ben Ladner on the podcast about the Eastern Conference, all kinds of stuff. Tower Jones is always a frequent guest on the podcast. So please go, go ahead and subscribe right now to this show. And without any further delay, we'll dive in right now with part one of two with myself and Glenn Willis. I am joined again by my friend Glenn Willis to do one of our long-awaited player capsules. Glenn, how are you as the calendar gets closer and closer to training camp? I'm, I'm glad it's Friday, man. This has been a brutal week from a work perspective. It's a good week, but just a lot of work to do. And so this is a nice way to put a put a bow on the week and get ready to transition into the, to the weekend. Absolutely. And uh, this is not going to go up for a couple of days, but we're recording this on Friday, as Glenn just said. So if anything changes, which it's, it shouldn't, that's one of the reasons why we hold this one until the end. This one and the other one that uh, that's looming, Jalen Johnson, is because not a lot is likely to change on these. Uh, but, you know, we've done this comprehensively that the whole roster almost at this point in time we've joked online and offline like what are we going to say about trey young after six years but I, I think you and i could find a way to find some things to talk about uh trey young just turned 26 years old in the last few days as people are listening to this so happy birthday to trey entering year seven of his nba career which makes me feel really old because i have been around for all of it I've seen every minute of trey's career it's been a little bit of a you know usually this superstar player you don't see every minute but i've been around the whole time and uh, oh, kind of a weird time for Trey, as we'll get into, but he had his first major injury of his entire life, he said, last year, where he missed like a third of the season, tore the finger ligament, is apparently back to 100% now, but still wasn't even into the summer, missed a lot of time. Honestly, a lot of guys would have shut it down for the season. He ended up wanting to come back, which I think was admirable that he came back. He was very limited when he came back, all that stuff. There's contract stuff, all of that. But okay, okay, Glenn, entering year seven. Where are you on the Trey Young meter right now? How are you feeling about Trey Young, broadly speaking? I mean, Trey is a phenomenal offensive talent. That's like you kept an obvious statement right there, right? Um, but for me, you know, in terms of what we're going to talk about, I what for me, it's like, what does the next level look like, right? I mean, he can score, right? We'll talk about the efficiency gap between himself and the top, top scoring guards in the league, maybe. We'll kind of get into that, right? Um, but in terms of kind of getting the – what he can do to get the team to the next level. I got some sort of examples in the last 10 years of guards that did little things that helped their team really kind of get to the next level. And I feel like for star players, a lot of times that's the difference between, you know, we know, you know, this team went to the conference finals. It feels like forever. <laughs> it feels like eight iterations back of this team. But um, but if you you know well, I, I'm interested in kind of what are the th other things he can do to impact winning, in addition to driving a very high potent offense, right? Um, that that's where my he head is kind of entering entering year seven. I, I think the context. I, first of all, I think Trey is the most over contextualized player in the whole league to me. <laughs> like people see him through the lens they want to see him through. Is that's what it, the way it seems to me? 
And, and and I feel like people talk about him like he just like he, they did when he was in year two, like as if he hasn't accomplished these historically these historical outlier kind of offensive numbers, right? Um, but people want to come back and say they have been winning, which is a common refrain there, right? Winning is a team objective to me. Now your your best players do have to do the most work and then do the most impressive work and most impactful work for sure. Um, but, you know, there's been coaching changes, system changes, scheme changes, players around him changing. They went from a great shooting team that Eastern Conference final runs to having less, you know, a lot less shooting on the team. Uh, they've gone to different kind of forms of smaller, you know, rotational play, you know. So there's, there's a lot of context there. But looking forward to kind of digging into if we can kind of spin this forward, what does, what does the next iteration of Trey look like? Perhaps that could uh, allow him to impact winning even more. Yeah, and it's a good way to sort of set the table a little bit for this conversation. And, you know, I've done sprinkles of this throughout the summer. I'm sure listeners to every show, which we definitely appreciate, uh, will have heard me repeat some stuff. But I think the way you put it's great. Like, it's like he's over-contextualized. I, I, I've described him, and you don't have to agree with me, but I think he's underrated now, like pretty clearly, compared to what he probably should be. And um, that still surprises me. I never thought that was going to happen just because of guys that put up numbers like he does don't traditionally get underrated. but it's just like it gets brushed away and uh, I get some of it's understandable, right? Like when your team stagnates and you are the face of the team and you're the best player on the team. Well, I mean, I mean, I'll agree with this all the time. A broader view of someone who's not looking at the team every day is going to put a lot of the quote unquote blame on the star player. It's the star player and the head coach to get the blame, right? That's across the board. Uh, and in the NFL, it's quarterback and head coach, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do think that it's fair to point out, as I have many times, that like if you were trying to build a team from scratch, I don't think I would pick Trey Young. Like it's hard to build a team around Trey Young. I will acknowledge that. That does not mean he's not awesome. Like he, he's very, very good. And the Hawks have made mistakes around him. Uh, like I said, last, last year was his first injury, his first injury really ever. He's been durable in a way that small guys often are not. All those things. Um, and context is key. I mean, I preach context about everything, but putting the team record on Trey Young without any sort of qualifier is insane, but you're right. I mean, even today, as we're talking, this is a few days ago, people have been listening to this. I, I shared some numbers that I'll probably get to later on in this podcast, actually. And I immediately got three responses about how the team won 36 games last year. And it's like, guys, I understand. I cover the team every single day. You don't have to tell me that the team didn't achieve what it was supposed to achieve. <laughs> that doesn't mean Trey Young is bad. Like it's not, you know, th there's always important nuance. And I think with Trey, even probably more so than any of these, maybe including Jalen, who we'll talk about later on. This entire conversation has to be has to be nuanced because everybody knows the broad strokes of Trey Young. Like you led with it, but the offensive brilliance, the numbers are great. I'll, I'll share some more of them. But like, what's the point of having this conversation between the two of us that watch every single minute of, of the Hawks all year long for years and years and years without going a step or two or three deeper into the guy who everyone knows kind of about already? Yeah, and, and I mean that's it. And you know, and it's not being anti-trade to say when you're building around a smaller guard, you do have a a narrower kind of um, path to take. And it has to be just right on the margins, you know, and that's different from, you know, building around a guy like Luca. Now, now Luke, Luca has his issues, like needs to get in shape, needs to lose some weight, you know, you know, needs to be more consistent on defense. A lot of that, you know, some of that applies to Trey. Um, but you know, but for me, I, I, I love Trey. I love watching Trey. I enjoy watching Trey. He's a, he's a maestro with the basketball, right? But there's a difference between being able to go out and hang 30 and 10 consistently on an opponent and doing that plus doing incrementally year over year, doing more and more and more things that impact winning. That's not, and I don't think Trey is not a winning player. I don't think that at all. If someone wants to say, well, that's my view because the Hawks haven't been winning. Fine, that can be your view. I'm not going <laughs> to challenge you on that, right? But for me, I, I don't think it's I, I don't think it's being anti-trade to say it, it's a narrower path with a, a with a, a point guard that size and parking another small guard in the backcourt that um, you know is not really capable of defending the two. Like the, there are there's roster construction and organizational evaluations that were missed, right? Uh, the last two three years, whatever amount of time. That kind of put the Hawks where they are. Does that mean Trey doesn't own any of the results? No, it doesn't mean that, right? And, and Trey would Trey would tell you, 
that, right? Trey, Trey takes ownership of kind of results of those sorts of things. Um, but this, and we'll talk about this year's roster is going to be very different, and I, and, I, and it's going to be interesting to see how, how the results change as as a as a result of that. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the best place to find tickets. There's nothing like checking out a live event, whether it is sports or music or comedy or theater. They also have a new feature at Game Time called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets even easier for you. They take away all the stuff through a filter that you actually don't need and show you the incredible deals on great seats that you do need. So there's no wasting time searching through thousands of different tickets. For example, there are awesome deals all the time, and especially for the Hawks season opener on October 23rd at home against Brooklyn, including a pair of tickets right now for $27 each, including fees at game time. That's an awesome deal, of course. There's more of that happening all the time at game time. Plus, my personal favorite feature at game time is the checking out the seats, and through the all-in pricing, there are no surprise fees at the checkout screen at the end. Also get a view from your seats in the app that's panoramic before you buy them, so you know exactly what you're getting into when you get to that venue that you are looking to buy from, and you're getting the lowest possible price guaranteed with the folks at game time take all the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time download the game time app create an account and use promo code locked on nba for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create that account with game time redeem that promo code it is locked on nba for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply download the game time app today what time is it it's game time So, you know, we could throw a curveball and start with defense. I'm not going to do that to you on, on the Trey Young episode. We'll come back to the defense later on. It does matter. Um, but let's just talk about the offense, of course. We leave with that for a reason. Um, I have some numbers that I will throw out there to kind of talk about how good he's been. But um, 95th percentile or better in offensive EPM in five consecutive seasons. Essentially, an elite offensive player. Um, there are, I will listen to arguments in any different ways about how you slice it where he lands on offensive creator lists, et cetera. There is nuance there, but him being a lead offensive player is not really controversial in my opinion. It's pretty clear by the body of work. Um, this is an interesting stat, but I, I found it today as we're, ta- as we're talking. Uh, last year, he was number two in the NBA in points created overall. And when I say that, I mean combination of your own scoring and what you assist on, only behind Luka Doncic. Uh that's a pretty impressive stat for an offensive creator. And it kind of marries what you do as a passer and as a scorer. You can't get on that list without being able to create as a passer as well. Um, and, you know, efficiency is going to be something that comes up in this conversation. But um, what did you see last last year in particular about his offense? Because I feel like there's this weird, I don't know if it's a narrative or what, that Trey had a quote unquote down season. And I think maybe that just has to do with the team with, with the team record. But if you look at his stat profile, aside from the injury, which again he's never had until this this year, there's really not any evidence that he had a down season in offense. Like that doesn't really, that's not there anywhere, other than just the team stuff, which again we'll we'll talk about more in the context about him, Dejounte, how it didn't work. That's been litigated forever. But do you agree with that sentiment, or am I am I, am I the crazy one? Because maybe it's me. I don't really see it. Yeah, I mean, I don't either. I I think I mean to to kind of circle back. I think there is some context that matters like number one sure you know i think the way i think the way trey wants to play like an all-star players would love to play the the way play the way that feels like they can make the most impact they're using their most natural skills right that's middle pick and roll possessing the ball all the time high usage being the creator being the initiator on possessions right i think we i think those of us who can kind of take a broad view know doing that across 82 games is a massive workload and you wonder how sustainable it is even for a guy who's as good as Trey, right? And then the, the counter context is how does Quinn want his team to play offensively, right? Move the ball, share the ball, move off the ball, get back onto the ball, you know, do something constructive when you're off the ball, whether you're setting a screen or cutting or creating space with some sort of movement on the on the backside. And for me, I felt like what happened in the beginning of the season was a slow start. It wasn't the first slow start he's ever had in his career. It was a slow start, right? We all saw that. It was just a little bit of how do we take these offensive principles that Clint, Quinn seems to have long um, valued, Trey's natural skill set, how do you find a recipe that accommodates all of that? Right. And I think that's going to be the big test this year. And so for me, if someone wants to say he had a down year, you know, I feel like they they kind of, um, you know, ping pong back and forth between 
letting Trey do his thing, trying to lean into what Quinn wants, Trey trying to do his thing. Oh, now we're down 11 points with six minutes to go take the reins off trade, just do your thing and try to bring us, you know. And so I felt like I feel like where there was uh, potentially some, especially the fourth quarter play, the fourth quarter play was rough, right, last year a lot, you know, except for the handful of games where DeJounte did close strong after Trey got hurt and those examples. But for me, it's like I can't, I'm so interested to see how if there's a more – effective and constructive mashup of Quinn's offensive philosophy and Trey's natural skills and strengths this year and to see if they can kind of make that work because I think that is what the next level looks like on offense is Trey setting screen. And he, and he did some of that last year. He set screens for DCs. I don't know if it went much past that. can't quite remember. And moving off the ball and being intentional, and there was some of that. Um, but like I said, when they got behind, as human beings often do, they kind of go back to their sort of reptilian state and do the, do the one thing that feels kind of natural to them to kind of climb back into games. And they played from behind a lot last year. And so I think that's what created a constraint around, you know, Quinn getting you know people to kind of buy into all of the nuance that he believes in offensively. And that's not just for Trey, but that's, that's others too, but Trey, being trans to do it as much as anyone else in my mind. Yeah, and it's really it's interesting because like I don't think it was a great year for Trey either. There's this like interesting discussion about it, and this I'm trying to be as broad as possible, but I, I don't think it was a down year. I don't think it was an up year. Like he's had better seasons, in my opinion, individually. The team success was of course not there. Um where he kind of falls in that spectrum is interesting. I'll share some numbers later about how like you know the lineup data and it's been a popular topic, but like basically it tells you that when Trey was the point guard and the only small guard, the Hawks were very, very good last year. And when he played with DeJounte or Patty Mills on a smaller sample size, another, another small defensive challenge guard in some ways, it didn't work. And I, there's some noise in there, but it's also kind of what you would maybe expect. And as far as Trey's concerned, like he still was league average or a little bit better than that in overall efficiency. Last year, but 59% true shooting, not elite elite, but if you are carrying the level of usage that he does with average or better efficiency, that's really, really good. And you mentioned it before, he had an awful start and that probably maybe soaked in to the discussion. I pulled this number. I was like first eight or nine games of the year. He was just brutal as a shooter, as a scorer, as an efficiency guy. And then the last Basically, from that point forward, he had like 61% true shooting. Like, he was basically fantastic from that point forward individually. Um, it, it is, but your, your point's a good one about like the scheme stuff because Trey, one of the knocks on Trey, right, is that he has to play a certain way and isn't willing to buy into certain things. And I get that criticism. I think it's overblown. But I do understand why people say that, because for the majority of his career, it was Trey Ball, right? You, it was pick and roll. It was what he was good at. They built it around him, which has made sense. He was the face of the franchise. They built the team around him. But then you bring in DeJounte, and suddenly you have another ball handler. We don't have to really get the whole thing again with DeJounte. But there is a balance, and I'm, I'm intrigued. This is going to spit, spit it forward a little bit about what it's going to look like now that they don't have. It's a different coach. It's a more innovative coach in Quinn than it was with Nate. They're running different stuff, but now there isn't the number two guy there. And the numbers point to that being pretty good from last year when DeJounte wasn't playing, but they still built the system, which they tried to, around the two of them. And now it's kind of back to Trey being the sun, moon, and the stars on offense. And I don't know how that how that's going to look. Yeah, I know. It, the, the whole idea he has to play a certain way. And first of all, do you think that's not true about Luka Doncic? Do you think that's not true about Shea Gilgis? Like <laughs> players want to do the things that they're good at, right? Do you think that's not true of James Harden? We can go on and on and on, right? Now the a difference is like last year Trey's true shooting was fifty eight and a half percent. Luka's was sixty one point seven. Luka can get if you don't guard Luka with a big wing, he can get to the front of the rim at will. Shea the floater getting to the paint at well, Shea was 63.6%, right? So that's a that's a big step up from where, where Trey was. And the difference is the, the ability to kind of get to the rim. A, a Trey at his size just doesn't have the, the same kind of dimensions, physical dimensions to work with as those guys. But those guys all want to stay within their template. 
you know, they just do. I mean, Luca's still developed an incredible step back that he makes work for him and deserves credit for that. But L- Luca likes to do two or three things on, a, on offense, right? And that's about it, right? And then you see people post videos of Trey giving the ball up and standing six feet behind the three point line and being like, oh my gosh. Like, and I always threaten. I can go find clips of Damian Lillard doing that, Luka Doncic doing that, Shea Gildas Alexander doing that, James Hart. Like, you would. Know, first of all, I'm not actually going to put any time to that because those people are not worth it. But if you if you think that Trey's the only guard that does that, and and, and by the way, like teams are running stuff where they want people a full step and a half to two steps behind the three point line, especially their best long range shooters, right? From from a spacing standpoint, and so the hyper fixation on the little things that Trey does that people think is an outlier is ridiculous. It's it, it, And it's infuriating. I mean, it has to be so frustrating for, for Trey and Trey's fans and Hawks fans and all that sort of stuff. So I, I, ha- I had to address that, right? But, you know, but, but for me, you know, I try to think about guards that have been part of a team that broke through to the championship level, right? And some of, now Steph Curry is the ridiculous standard, right? But Steph's moving off the ball, giving the ball up, coming back onto the ball, setting screens, working hard, all that sort of stuff. But maybe, maybe a better example for me of just, and I'm not saying this should be the template for Trey, but like when the Raptors won the title, they ran 3 1 pick and roll that whole freaking finals. It was Kyle Lowry setting screen after screen after screen for Kawhi to get Kawhi switched onto a guard and Lowry doing. All the and I make fun of Larry on Twitter all the time for you know <laughs> flops and all that sort of stuff. But um, but Lowry doing all the little stuff, setting screens, being physical as a screener, forcing that switch, not tolerating a guy getting over the screen, taking the foul if the guy was a risk, and Kawhi ate that whole series uh, because of what he did. And so a lot of times guards in that sense have to lean into these other tactics, these other roles that they have to have to make that work. Now, the Hawks don't have a, you know, a wing that's going to score 28 points a game yet. Maybe, maybe Jalen's there in two years or something like that. Who knows, right? Um, but but the, you can look back at examples of things that guards do beyond scoring and assisting that give their team another wrinkle, give their team another direction to go that really makes a difference. And like I said, Cal, I mean, people want to point at that great finals run Kawhi had. To me, if Kyle Lowry doesn't do the work he does in that finals just as a screen setter, the Raptors don't win that series, right? And so I don't know yeah. that in setting a screen like 18 times a game like Lowry did in that series. Maybe it was more like 40 towards the end, <laughs> end of that series. But it's it's finding those other areas to contribute that broadens the no, the the the, the brings more variety to the number of ways you can impact the offense. If you're seeing hard hedges on every screen, if you're getting double, if they're forcing the ball out of your hands, like what do you have? You developed other skills. Do you have other things that you can do to contribute? And to me, I'm not saying it's some like massive, horrible deficiency, but that is the next, for me, I think the next area of growth for Trey is what are those things he can do to continue helping his offense? Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Football is here in a big way. If you're an NFL fan, start the season right with a big return at FanDuel. FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. If you happen to have a hunch in the middle of a game, check out a ton of different information sets from a live stats and play-by-play to the latest overarching stuff and much more on the same page when you are placing your bets at FanDuel Sportsbook. You also get started with a great offer from FanDuel. And that is $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet at FanDuel. You should also know the FanDuel Sportsbook app is really easy to use as well. They have everything that you're looking for in the sports betting space from over-unders to point spreads to live betting. They have money lines and player props, same game parlays, future bets, and much more. The app is safe and secure at FanDuel. They cover the entire range of sports as well. That includes the NBA, as you might expect. Listen to this podcast. WNBA is there. NFL, college football, baseball, hockey, golf, tennis, soccer, auto racing, boxing, MMA and so much more. And now is an awesome time to sign up with the folks at FanDuel Sportsbook. And the place to go is FanDuel.com to get started and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. One more time, visit FanDuel.com and check out America's number one sportsbook. I think it's a great point and one I agree with. It's not like in the, it gets, as with anything, it gets painted as like you're either pro or again. And no, like I think that he does have things he can do better. I think we saw some of that. You mentioned it. Like he, he has upped his screens a little bit, him playing off the ball. He's been more willing 
I would say, is the word I would use. And I use that word intentionally because there is a buy-in that he has to have to do stuff that's not with the ball in his hands. And that's always been a controversy about Trey is like, is he willing to do this stuff? I think the answer is yes. We've seen it more. He's become more mature. He's bought in. Um, but I agree. Like there's more that he can do to be a threat off the ball, to be a screener, to be, you know, just doing other things. Um, also, I just want to bring some of this up about his own profile while we're here. Cause you mentioned before, like him, him not getting into the rim a ton last year was actually his lowest uh, percentage of shots in his career at the rim. About 17% of his shots at the rim, according to cleaning the glass, it's a very low number. Um, part of that is that he took more threes last year. He took a career high in three point attempts, as far as like percentage and how many he took. He shot them well, 37% on threes. So he was hunting more threes, which I've always wanted him to do, frankly, but also got got to the rim a lot less. Maybe some of that, um, not to do this whole like jag, but I think in particular with Shea, Shea has the benefit of playing every minute of his life with five out spacing. And it's, it's nice to be able to do that when you have just yeah. perfect spacing around you at all times. <laughs> Trey doesn't have that, nor, nor we maybe I, I, honestly, he's never had that. Even when they had a lot more shooting, there's, there's always been a, a big of some kind with him. But there were, um, there was maybe like 200 minutes. They played Gallo at five. That, you know, yeah. Something like there's that. Maybe 200 like, minutes they played Gallo at five. And like that, 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 that's it. That's all they had, you know? Yeah. It's hard to get to the rim. I mean, and look, I don't know if he can't get to the rim anymore like he did before. Not that he can't, but you know what I mean? I don't know if it's intentional or it's a skill thing or it's, you know, he's not like he's still in smack, but smack dab in the middle of his prime. It's not like he's lost a step physically at 25, 26, but he did. I don't, I don't, maybe it was a conscious decision to just, you know, kind of turn those into threes or because uh, his, his floater range volume was kind of about the same, by the way, he's still really, really good at the floater range shots always underrated about him is that his floater is incredibly good. He shot 46% on floaters last year. It's like a 70th percentile outcome, which for a six, one guard is very, very good. Um, but his usage was actually down last year. Now it's still quite high. Don't get me wrong. He's still a very high usage player, but part of that was maybe that they had DeJounte. They were trying to run through more, more through DeJounte, et cetera. Um, and I want to come back to foul drawing in a second, because that's a big part of his game. That's like both polarizing in a good way, good and bad way. But on the usage front, do you envision it going back to, you know, two or three years ago, Trey, where he was leading the league in usage? It was him and Harden, basically, or maybe Luca. Last year, and maybe even the year before that, but especially last year, it was more like he's still like top 10 usage, but he's more like the bottom of it because they were playing a lot through DeJounte. Is it going to just ping pong back in your mind, or is it going to be maybe – uh, where it was last year, which just means more for Bogey, more for Jalen, etc. It's a little hard to answer because basically there's two kinds of usage: one is scoring usage, and one is passing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it depends on so it depends on what definition we're using and what formula we're using and all that sort of stuff. So for me, because they have more more cutters, more guys that can run in transition, multiple guys that can run in transition, I would think if his usage stack stacks back up to be at about the same level. I wonder if the shot attempts might fall a little bit and the assists number somehow, <laughs> somehow might even go up, up a little bit just because of how much more dynamic, they have more dynamic finishers on this team. They have guy wings with length that can get to the rim. We've talked about that on, on previous episodes, right? And so I, I, my guess is it's pretty close to the same, but the maybe there's a little bit more kind of um, equal parts scoring and passing than, than what we've seen at times. I, mean, I don't, I think the average NBA fan has no idea how great of a score Trey is right now. Anyone can pull up the stats and poke at the efficiency, right? For, and that's fair. Like he's not in this, you know, he doesn't put the same kind of efficiency of numbers, but in, in terms of passers, it's Luca, Trey, Doncic, Harden 30 games a year, so whatever number of games like Harden is kind of capable of doing that. Maybe it's maybe I'm not giving Harden enough, enough credit there, hard to know. But that's really about it. That, that's really a, about it. Now, Tyree, Tyrese has had a yeah, phenomenal Halloran's year good. last year, but it's first time in the playoffs. Yeah, he, I mean, first time in the playoffs, we kind of saw what it looked like to face that kind of defensive attention the first time. So, so for me, I, I think it's probably going to be pretty close to the same. 
But my hope is that if they lean into some of the offensive principles that creates easier shots, which is what Quinn's looking for. Part of Trey shooting more threes last year is just that Quinn demanded his team shoot more threes. That's just that's part of it, which including Trey, right? Um, but for me, I think the the goal is, if you, and again, I go back to peak Warriors, right? They stressed you out the three point line, but what they're really trying to do is get you to have five guys out defending the three point line, and they were getting eight points a quarter right at the rim that were completely uncontested. I think that's what Quinn's going for too, is to kind of create that stress. Um, now, when another team has a Steph and a Clay, both like good luck to the rest of the league. You know, that, <laughs> nobody has that right now. Um, but but the, but the concept of you know use a three point line, create stress, stress stretch the defense out. And the real goal is easy shots at the rim. With Trace passing, you got Dyson cutting, you've got V cutting, you've got other guys cutting, you know, those sorts of things. Jalen living at the rim, possibly, if if he makes the adjustment that would give him that. I mean, Trey could set a – I mean, I would expect Trey could set a career high in assists somehow, you know, with all of those shots at the rim. And if they, you know, recalibrate some of the center play and, you know, things like that, which – we've long talked about but i think i I just i think it's pretty similar but just maybe a different breakdown of scoring versus passing usage yeah speaking of the passing uh he was second in the nba last year assist per game and first in percentage uh obviously that's quite good uh he's played six years he has increased his assist per game in every season successively all the way to 10.8 last year 10.8 10.8 is this game is like hard to fake. Like, you know, you got to be a great passer. Uh, I did this riff when we talked about Dyson last week. But yes, Trey turns the ball over a lot. He does. That's okay. Um, obviously, there are nights when I will point it out that it's too much. You can't turn the ball over eight times a game. And he, and he doesn't do that. He averages like four a game, which is a lot. But it's not like he's averaging 10. And I'll just list. I, I pulled this just for you, Glenn. Uh, here are the players in the top 10 of the league in turnovers last year. Luka Doncic. Giannis, Giannis Antetokounmpo, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Anthony Edwards, Nikola Jokic, uh, Paolo Boncaro, Victor Womanyama, and Demonis Sabonis and Trey. That's the top 10. There are no bad players on that list. <laughs> there are guys that are better than others, but you're like, Jokic is on the list, best player in the world, Luka's up there, all that stuff. Turnovers come with, the, come, come with the territory. It is what it is. There are nights, again, where he ball security should be better. I'm not saying that there, that there aren't, but when you handle the ball as much as he does, turnovers will come. That's just part of the deal. Also, turnovers have situational impact. So, to, I mean, you have to really contextualize time, score, situation. You know, first of all, they're human beings. Like, there are going to be physical mistakes. That's going to happen, right? Especially for someone who's playing, you know, in a, in a close game, 38 minutes or something like that, like Trey, or right? a smaller guard. Um, but but for me, like, uh, a dead ball turnover versus a light ball turnover, big difference. Hugh, I mean, the, the the impact of that is like 4X, right? And um, and so for me, I just think sometimes just to look at raw numbers, and, and I've said before, I think turnovers are half an individual stat, half a team stat, right? I, when I was breaking down that Hunter video a while back, I almost posted a pass, that he, a turnover he had, where Jalen, they're running um, th- um, slot pick and roll Hunter and Jalen. And there was a seem for Jalen to sprint into and Hunter passed it to Jalen as if he were going to sprint to the seam. Jalen instead popped to the three point line turnover. And I was going to say, this is an example of a team turnover, right? And Hunter immediately yeah. like, threw his hands up in the air. Like, why are you not diving into the scene? J- J- it was early in the year. Jalen wasn't that experienced with all the stuff at that time. But like I said, I think turnovers are half team and half individual there. Are, you know, we know carelessness when we see it, right? We sure. know, trying to make a pass that wasn't there when we see it. Um, you know, trying to execute a play and it just didn't click. The timing was off a little bit. Like, that's team stuff. So so for me, yeah. I just think that sometimes people oversimplify looking at a flat, you know, turnover per game number and not, not understanding that, you know, some turnovers have are, are way more harmful than others. And one more thing, and uh, it's, a, it's a pet peeve of mine, but it's also really almost – as relevant for Trey as it is for any player in the league, is that uh, especially for guards, and I say that for beyond Trey, we got to stop using field goal percentage as an efficiency metric for guards. In the modern NBA, as as much as these guys take threes, 
you got to go beyond field goal percentage. So like there's this notion that Trey is quote unquote unquote inefficient when I, he, he's been a league average in true shooting or better every year of his career. And that's a better efficiency metric than field goal percentage. And part of that is taking, taking more threes, which is a league wide thing, but also with Trey, look, I, I'd be the first to raise my hand and tell you that Trey's inefficient. If you, if you took free throws out of the game, Trey would be inefficient. He would be that. And that's worth it. You could say that out loud. There's, that's, there's something that we have to just acknowledge that, but it does matter. And it is a skill that he has developed since he was born, probably to be able to get to the line and not only get to the line, but turn those free throws into elite free throw percentage, which means points. And I understand it's not always aesthetically pleasing. People don't like to watch free throws. I get all that. There was this whole, uh, I'm sure you remember this, Glenn, a couple of years ago when they changed the rule and Trey was one of the poster boys for this. It's like, oh, Trey's young free throws are going to go in the toilet. Guess what? That didn't happen because Trey Young gets to the line and he knows how to, he knows how to get to the line. They went down a little bit, but Trey still this year, I believe, took more than 10 attempts per 100 possessions. Top eight in the league. The only guy who is near his size that's at the top of the league is Trey Young. It's a developed skill. You don't have to like it, but it is part of efficiency. And again, of the guys who get to the line as much as he does, he's the best free throw shooter of all of them. So maybe that'll go away at some point. Maybe when he's 32 years old, he can't get to the line anymore. And that'll be a problem. But for 26-year-old Trey Young, it's pretty safe to be like, hey, bank on 10 free throws per 100 possessions and 85%, 90% from the free throw line. That will boost your efficiency. It all matters. It all counts. Yeah, and, and this is another category. It's like, like for people that want to sing out Trey as a foul beater, get out of here. You know, I mean, Joel Embiid, Luka Doncic, my favorite, quote favorite, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, you know, a trip, a trip by a defensive player is a foul on every play. Jimmy, but if you are moving and you in the heater and the penalty or in the bonus, Jimmy Butler will go trip himself on you and get himself to the three point, like on purpose, like trip himself on. You. That stuff drives me crazy, right? And I get people pushing back on the aesthetics, right? For sure, Harden, Embiid. You know, you know, Lowry used to Lowry when he was still high usage guy was way up there and stuff. So I don't mind people saying like I can't stand when players do this. When when someone wants to make this about a single player, like I have, I have no time for you. I have, I have absolutely no time for you. Um, so that that's uh, just you know important to say. But it and the other thing is I think people don't realize like when Trey's not shooting the ball, well, he's going to try it's a three throw line to get some rhythm. He's wants to see that's one way to get the ball, see the ball go through the hoop, get the feeling of having some success. And, you know, you know, that's a, that's something that the, all the best scorers do, right? All the best scorers try to get the free throw line and see the ball go, go through the basket. So um, it, it's a huge part of his game. Um, when people say players who do that is a detractor from kind of the viewability, our good friend, you know, Kevin Chenard calls it product dilution. <laughs> and he, there's a lot of other forms of product dilution, a lot defensively, a lot of, you know, you know, um, but that's one form of it. But for me, like, yeah, I mean, I don't always enjoy it for sure. Right. Sure. Trying to, he's trying to win games, you know? So, yeah. I mean, that's, there, there are, again, I, I have said before, there, are, there are times and I've seen every, I'm not kidding. Every minute of trace career I've watched. I'm not, that's not a badge of honor. It's just, he's been here the whole time I've been covering the team. It is what it is. There are times when it's absurd. Like I'll laugh and be like, man, that's not, if I'm the, if I'm oh, on the other totally. side, I'm, I'm, I'm furious. You know, I'm, I'm not saying it's like always aesthetically pleasing because it's not, but it still matters. It's still efficiency. And if you remove the, the outlier ones where it's like, man, what are we doing here? He still has a, I, I don't, I said on purpose, it's a talent to get to the line the way that he does. And it's not all foul baiting. It's like he 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 knows how to move. He knows how to sell. He knows how to you know sell a call. But also he will get under you in a way that it's all intentional. He's so smart. And I don't mean this is like a Trey Young praise fest, but no matter how he gets there, he's taking 10, 11, 12 runner possessions and shooting 85% on them. And like that will just that just helps you. It's yeah. it's the same thing as the opposite. So if you want to, I'll pick up my own guy. Click Capella getting to the free throw line is not necessarily a positive, right? He shoots 60% at the absolute best. So like, it's not going to boost your efficiency. So if you want to knock Clint or knock whatever bad free throw shooter you want to, great. It, it's factored into true shooting. It, it all matters, but you got to praise the yeah. other guy for getting the line a lot yeah. and make all the free throws. 
You do. And I mean, the only when, when Clint getting the free throw line helps us when the other team's starting center is very good defensively, you can get him in foul trouble like that. There, there's yes. the residual value of that, right? So we can kind of go there, right? Um, the other part is Trey, you know, you said it, like the only small guy on that list of guys who are the highest volume free throw shooters. And, uh, something Trey has to, has to deal with gets grabbed more, gets pushed more, bigger wings are defending him. And it, it, Trey will give you like two or three possessions and he'll say something to the ref like, you got to stop this. And you know what? If the ref's going to let them do that, he's going to go get a foul. He's going to go run into him, fall on the floor. He's going to hook him, try to make it look like a defense. Like Trey, Trey has to get tactical when he's getting hand-checked, when he's getting pushed, when he's getting grabbed. Some games the refs let that stuff go more than other games. And every player, mm -hmm. Trey included, has to read – the standard for officiating in the game. And if he has to go do that to get himself some relief, to get himself some space, to get himself kind of freed up to do some things, he's going to do that. So sometimes you could, I mean, sometimes I feel like I watch Trey and Trey's like looking at the ref, like I'm giving this two or three more. Positions. If you don't do something about all this grabbing, grabbing, I'm going to have to do something. And then all of a sudden he's like, okay, I'm done. And he'll get to the free throw line, two or three straight possessions on just kind of ridiculous looking stuff. But how many casual fans or fans and there's nothing I'm not I don't use that in a derogatory way, you know that. Yeah, don't realize that this was building up for three, four possessions. And then Trey was like, I've had enough. I'm gonna go get myself to the free throw line because I can't if I don't, I can't do anything here. And that's all a factor. All right, that is all for part one of two with myself and Glenn Willis talking all things Trey Young. Please stay tuned after this podcast is over because part two should be available in this same podcast feed that you are listening to or watching immediately following part one. So please stay tuned for that. Please subscribe to the show, listen to the rest of the conversation. Follow us on Twitter slash X at Lockdown Hawks. Follow me there at BT Roland. Follow my non-podcast work at patreon.com slash BT Roland. One more time, please subscribe to the show. Thanks for listening and we'll see you all next time.